Welcome and thank you for joining us for Euro CMR 2017 Highlights. My name is Chiara Bucciarelli Ducci from the University of Bristol. I'm the ECVI Vice President and the Chair of the Section CMR. So together with me uh, in, uh, in the studio is Dr. Francisco Pendurada from the Royal Brompton Hospital and in remote connection there is Professor James Moon from Barts Heart Center. So what we're going to discuss today is, uh, is the highlights of um, EuroCMR, which was held in Prague at the end of May. As you know, EuroCMR is uh, one of the meetings that uh, the ECVI offers. ECVI is the ESC Imaging Association, so the Association of Cardiovascular uh, Imaging. It's one association by four imaging modalities, uh, ECHO, CMR, Nuclear Cardiology, and Cardiac CT. And as such, uh, we offer three different meetings um, currently, and it's Euro ECHO, which is mainly focused on ECHO, but it's the largest uh, ECVI meeting with also several multimodality sessions. And then we have Euro CMR, which is focused on cardiac MRI, and ICNIC, uh, which is focused on uh, cardiac CT and nuclear cardiology. So ECVI is the multimodality imaging environment of the ESC, and uh, we are truly enjoying being part of this association, which has allowed cardiac MRI to really flourish and, uh, and uh, be embraced more in the cardiology work, as we're going to learn from the highlights tonight. EuroCMR this year has been a record-breaking event with over 1,000 attendees. And uh, this has been a, a, a very exciting results for all of us working hard uh, to make this conference a success. In particular, if we're looking uh, at the growth of the conference over the years, uh, we're learning that what it was uh, a fairly small size, 450, 500 attendees, has now become uh, quite a large conference. And uh, already in Florence last year, we reached what it was a record at the time. And this year, we, bro we broke this record with over 1,000 um, attendees in Prague. And uh, additional uh, stats regarding the conferences that we have witness witnessing, uh, plus 35% in registration compared to the previous year. And also we have attendees from 68 countries and faculty from 29 countries. So this is a testament really that cardiac MRI is growing across the world and the ESC and EuroCMR are also embracing um, countries outside Europe in atten attending our uh, conferences. Also, the stats interestingly revealed that uh, at least half of the participants at EuroCMR, it's a young community, is less than 40 years of age, and also 30% of the faculties were female. And this is in line with the ESC initiatives of embracing women to actually be more actively uh, participants of the activities uh, of the ESC and beyond. This is a snapshot of the countries and in nationalities that were represented at the meeting, so the faculty of attendees. And as you clearly see, it's well beyond Europe that uh, CMR has managed to attract attendees. And particularly we have several delegates from Australia, but also from the United States and Asia. This is the breakdown of the countries represented in each continent. And of course, Europe was the largest participation and virtually every single country in Europe attended with exception really of a handful of countries, which we're hoping uh, we're gonna have at the next Cardiac MRI meeting. We also had participants from uh, Australia, as I said, South America, interestingly, and uh, lots of uh, colleagues from Asia and the Middle East joined us and also colleagues from Africa. So truly a uh, international and worldwide conference. And uh, clearly the success of the conference has been the hard work and the effort of the program chair, James Moon, which we're gonna hear uh, shortly, and also Francisco Pendurada that put together the very la large amount and record-breaking submissions of cases and abstracts. But also warm thanks to the local host, which have been doing an amazing work uh, to advertise the conference locally and to bring a lot of attendees from uh, Czech Republic, but also Eastern Europe. So a warm thank you. And as sometimes happens, you know, I know everybody can attend the conferences and that's why we decided to do this webinar to allow those of you that could not join us in Prague to actually learn about the content of the conference and not miss out on the new advances on uh, CMR. And with that, uh, I would like to introduce Professor James Moon. So James, please tell us what were the highlights of the conference uh, on the closing opening plenary, but also the invited talks. 
I had a slight drop out in sound then. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. The meeting was really big this year. Three tracks, special sessions, e-posters, and the quickfire over 2.5 days. Uh, what that meant was there were over 150 speakers, plus all the abstract presenters and case presenters and, and a lot of chairs as well. So thank you very much. But what it also meant, uh, can you have the next build on that slide, please? Uh, can I have the next build on that slide, please? Next, please. Okay. Was that uh, n no one could attend more than a quarter of the meeting. So I'm going to show you some aspects of what I saw looking back. Next, please. Okay, so our opening plenary was from Jerome Bax, the president of ESC, and he really highlighted one aspect of the problem. And this is the age pyramid, the demographics for Europe in 20 2004. Next. And look how it grows to 2014 over more, slightly more than 10 years, and then to 2050. We have a big demographic bulge, and that's going to put a lot of pressure on services. And we need to get smarter with more personalized therapies and treatments. Next. Uh, our opening plenary was about how we might do things in the future. Uh, Peter Kelman started by looking at how scanning is evolving. And there you see a number of uh, sequences deriving biological information. And he's now, and others as well, have made approaches where all of that can be done free breathing, which is really important because it, uh, it's an approach where the sickest patients still give excellent image quality. Uh, and some of those are quite familiar. Uh, but some of them less so, and we have to work out how to use these new biomarkers for clinical care to change outcomes. Next, please. Oh, it's not just about new sequences, uh, but it's also about old friends. Here is some late enhancement imaging, but all of this is done with motion correction and free breathing, giving us consistently excellent quality, even in patients who you suspect are quite poor breath holders, like that amyloid at the bottom there. So also making it easier for our technicians and for people to report. And if it's easier to report, quality goes up. Next, please. One of the things that's being redeveloped is uh, perfusion mapping uh, to give us uh, quantitative perfusion. But look at the other outputs that might be coming uh, to our clinical attention. There are maps there for T1 and T2, which we're now familiar with, but also T2 star, ECV, and now things that we're completely unfamiliar with, like permeability and intramyocardial blood volume, there will be promising new insights from these. And they're around the corner and being delivered already in some specialist centers. So quite exciting stuff, really. Uh, we ne we're quite familiar with where MRI currently resides, but some people are pushing the limits. This is a, a study from Pierre Croissille, who talked about extreme CMR. He's been taking a magnet up to the high Alps and scanning people who are doing extraordinary things. Here, there's an individual who's just finished a 300-kilometer run, the Tour des Géantes. Uh, and that's a sort of multi-organ inflammatory, almost like a model of intensive care critical illness. And there you can see global edema, facial edema. He's trying to open his eyes, that competitor. And he was measuring uh, heart function and found almost no effect on heart function of running 300 kilometers. Although there was BMP and troponin, the heart seemed to cope quite well. And later we see that some acute exercise in some of the other sections does hit, for example, the RV quite significantly in the short term. Next, please. That's uh, a rather niche use of MRI in the developed world, but what about the developing world? Uh, this is a slide from Giuliano from Brazil, and he highlights the issues that we all have, but in the developing world, they're extreme, with not enough trained physicians, insufficient scanners, a high burden of disease, and as ever, not enough money. So he's been making approaches to the faster, cheap, easier with targeted exams, this is a 10 minute scan there uh, using efficient sequences within wrappers of education and training and embedding these sorts of approaches into clinical care at really societal and international uh, levels. Uh, so bringing our technology 
developed in high GDP countries to a global audience where it's needed. That requires research and Graham Cole started a session in parallel uh, to that plenary just as the abstracts were starting on delivering CMR research and he looked at how sometimes we've misled ourselves uh, in our effort to try and get that key paper. If you look at the bottom there on the effect size of ejection fraction in stem cell studies, you see that minor errors and abnormalities in how the studies were reported correlate with the effect size, suggesting that uh, the best studies uh, were delivering no actual effective ejection fraction uh, changes, suggesting that in some ways we have some sort of publication bias going on. And uh, on the right hand side of the screen, you see that uh, we don't look after our data long term very well, and that we have to reinvent our cohorts. Here, for example, over the years after a paper is published, effectively the data becomes unavailable and we have to start again. So we highlighted a number of areas that is well worth listening to on the recorded, uh, 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 all the talks are recorded. Have a listen if you're designing studies because design and plausibility uh, will make a difference to the outcomes uh, that you get and accelerate the delivery of better tests to clinical practice. Next, please. Uh, one of the big topics at the moment is big data and how we're doing things. Stefan Peterson from the UK, the future uh, section chair, talked about that and he alluded first to how we do things at the moment and he showed this slide from Bob Balaban from SCMR where a child is drawing circles and suggesting that we are children in our approach to measuring the ventricle. Now I'm a strong believer in doing things uh, initially yourself to learn what it takes to get good values, but we need to replace this with something else. And he talked about big data and new machine learning approaches. I didn't know much of this. These four velocity, four Vs for big data, really uh, new areas that we have to learn because everyone's doing this. Uh, next build, please. Uh, he actually showed a little uh, tweet there from someone where everyone is talking about big data but not necessarily doing it, but everyone wants to get on the bandwagon. Next, please. And actually, there is big data out there already. You just have to think of this photo of him on his iPhone, uh, and it shows that that is geostamped, tagged. You can see the other photos. You know that there are other SCMR members in this case out there. You can infer from his calendar that there was a meeting. You could probably pick up his credit card details, and actually you get a really rich picture if you can combine those things. Uh, in this case, um, for a trivial reason, but actually within healthcare, we could get insights that will really help us change outcomes. But that's a challenge. How are we going to use these things to change our patient's care? Next, please. One of the uh, 3D Echo talks alluded to uh, computers being a tool and they're not going to stop us making mistakes. Uh, they'll just help us make mistakes faster if we're not careful. So let's move on to another session. I don't know how many of you are at the chest pain session. We have modalities that compete a little bit. Functional versus anatomical, we're trying to do the best thing. And sometimes uh, real world and clinical trials is not the same. So Oliver uh, showed, went through this and showed some problems for trial data and how you should interpret it. I was really struck by the referral pattern to SPECT from US, I think, data showing how much the prevalence of previously unknown uh, ischemia has fallen over time. And if you designed a trial with the expectations from 1991 in, in, in 2009 or now, you would uh, get a negative study. Next, please. Now, this was a brave talk of Adam Timmis, who's been working with uh, NICE in the UK, quite an influential body who uh, give us guidelines on how to test for chest pain. And actually, the new NICE guidelines have changed, and they're suggesting that whatever your pretest probability for a typical or atypical chest pain with a 10 to 90% pretest probability, actually, cardiac CT is a really good test. Uh, and if that's non-contributory, then go down a functional imaging test like stress echo or perfusion CMR. Of course, there are lots of dependencies there. You need to have excellent CT quality control systems availability. Uh, but that's quite a, an important statement if it's uh, borne out by experience in the real world. 
uh, because we can use that cardiac MR where it really adds value. So we're refining the use of our technology. Next, please. I don't know how many of you went to the valve disease debate. We had ECHO versus CMR, Sweden, UK uh, debate. And uh, this was a nice picture from, I think, the International Space Station of one of their astronauts about to undertake ECHO. Uh, it, it's a rather extreme example of how we're never going to have um, uh, cardiac MR in space, I doubt. So there are some areas where cardiac MR can't reach. But next, please. He did point out that actually ECHO will always have major advantages. I don't think they're going to go away. But he highlighted actually that some aspects of echo fluid valve lesions may be better by MRI, for example, regurgitation. Uh, he was a very, it was a very conciliatory uh, talk. Uh, and then he put in a picture of Kate Bush singing. I'm not entirely sure why, but it was a nice end to his talk. Uh, this was a picture of an echo from Saul Myerson from Oxford. I think MR is really flourishing there. But sometimes you do get poor poor echoes like these. Not always, but sometimes. So complementary test is you. Uh, I learned a bit about MR in this, uh, specifically for clinical delivery of valvular regurgitation. Uh, I think I should have known this, but next bill, please. Uh, here, um, Saul is showing how he pilots uh, uh, flow maps for regurgitation right on the valve tips and we've actually uh, changed our process because we were piloting a little bit further away and very nice uh, regurgitant curves there with the piloting right on the valve tips. True quantification of regurgitation. Next please. One bit of the heart that I don't know so much about is the right ventricle. Uh, it, it's, it's a difficult uh, bit of the circulation to study, but of course it is a circulation, so every red cell goes through the right ventricle. And we saw some really important insights across a few key diseases. Here, pulmonary hypertension, showing that measures of the ventricle and the vascularity, uh, the coupling and the pulmonary artery all predict outcomes. So you're trying, you're having to measure the whole thing. And different aspects here, for example, from Dezina uh, in, in the ECHO versus CMR section showed that if you try and use one test, you may not see the whole picture. Quite a nice slide. Next, please. Uh, this was uh, Gianni showing the complexity of uh, the fibre arrangements. Next, please, in the right ventricle, something that we're not really fully appreciating yet in clinical practice, but it's a very elegant structure and an equal part of the circulation to the left ventricle. Yet so much of what we do focuses on the left ventricle. Next, please. Uh, we, we're, we're into imaging with cardiac MR, but imaging can be electrical. And this is electrical mapping combined with anatomical mapping in the cath lab to guide therapy, delivering therapy to where it's needed with the aim of improving outcomes with less energy in the wrong place. Next, please. Uh, highlighting as ever and throughout all the talks, they were very clinically focused, that it's all about clinical context. And yes, our imaging needs to reduce su surprises, but you have to keep your overall patient focus uh, in mind as you look at the images. Next, please. One study that uh, I wasn't able to go to, but I was listening to, and it's well worth listening to, was Andre Lagersh. Uh, we had 14 people come over from Australia, excellent talks. And this is Andre. And I think, to me, that looks like he has a pulmonary artery catheter in and that he's about to have a cardiac MR with exercise. So really doing his bit for science there. Next, please. Lots of slides showing the interrelations of pressure and the RV and left ventricular structure uh, at rest and stress. And he highlights that exercise really does hit the RV more than the LV uh, and that there are major changes. And if we really want to understand the impact of disease and uh, some adaptive responses like exercise, we're going to have to understand the RV much more and the heart at exercise. Really key part because many diseases seem to reveal themselves first during exercise. Next, please. There are lots of other topics. I just wanted to show a few bits here. One was on overlapping phenotypes.
side of the screen with the uh, genetic mutations there leading to protein abnormalities and then and familiar cardiac phenotypes, HOCOM, DCMA, RVC, but also we're getting overlaps like those two cases at the bottom. Uh, we're entering a world where our phenotyping by multimodality imaging and this cardiac MR especially are going to be linking much more tightly with the genetics and we're going to, I think, lead to an era of much more personalized medicine, not based on genotype only, but on the gene phenotype uh, that the patient has when they present to you. I really liked, I'm going to go back one actually, I really liked the 4D flow session as well. Uh, excellent speakers. Um, if you can see if you can click on that movie again to make it work. Uh, the 4D flow is beginning to have very high quality images and here is the diastolic uh, atrial flow through in a, with a multi-vent sequence. But there are, again, new concepts for us to learn, especially about energy, kinetic energy, because the heart ultimately is about delivering power and a circulation to get you know, oxygen to tissues. And new ways of displaying data with streamlines and path lines and particle tracing, but also new aspects of old, f apparently familiar concepts like the ejection fraction. And actually, in these talks, uh, was revealed that the ejection fraction isn't as simple as that with you know, delayed ejection and retained inflow and many aspects of how the blood passes through the ventricle, receiving energy to pass it around the body. Really interesting area and one that's growing fast because these acquisitions are getting more available and faster. So we have one at my center that takes two minutes to acquire. Next, please. Uh, I'm interested in myocardium and the fibrosis session was a really superb one. I point you to Eric Shelbert from the US's uh, histology slides of dilated cardiomyopathy uh, showing that fibrosis is really a, a, a fundamental part of cardiomyopathy. And he highlights that we concentrate on the insult and we call it diabetes or coronary disease, but actually it's the fibrotic response and how the myocardium responds that is more important. So if we can start to measure that in ever richer ways, we're more likely to be able to target our treatment better. And we started like in the top hand from Ike and Nagel and Robert Manker's uh, talks about late enhancement techniques and the patterns there and the extent, so pattern and extent, really about diagnosis and risk, but also alluding to the new tests for diffuse fibrosis like native T1 mapping and ECV and how actually some aspects of the technical aspects of acquiring the data are really important uh, there for example slice profile and how you draw a region of interest to avoid blood marker uh, blood contamination but also if you overdo it you may miss endocardial scar next please Closing plenary, we had four excellent speakers. I'm going to divide them into two. Matthias Friedrich and Daniel Mizrogli updated us about new guidelines or consensus statements. The myocarditis uh, consensus from Lake Lu called Lake Louise is being updated, and that's adding two techniques that we communally have developed, T1 mapping and T2 mapping for myocardial edema. So part of clinical practice now, and this is important because inflammatory conditions are increasingly recognized. Inflammation is part of how cardiomyopathy develops. Uh, we also had a new mapping consensus. We had a T1 mapping before, and now it's uh, all the mapping because there's such overlap in the technical aspects. And some aspects are really practical on how we're going to deliver this for patients. So for example, reference ranges, rather than just being recommended, are, are describing exactly how many patients you need or healthy volunteers you need to get a good enough sample of what your normal values are so that we can detect change and abnormality in patients. A few other little bits there like for example T2 star mapping should not be done at 3T, quite an important statement and one that's been skirted around up to now. Um, T2 star is, is tricky at 3T. Next please. We also had uh, um, Sven Plein and John Greenwood uh, talking to us. Sven on some of the latest thinkings about safety. We always need to think about whether we're doing things as safely as possible. And but sometimes if we're overcautious, we can 
uh, inadvertently cause harm. And it's looking like we have been overcautious with scanning uh, implanted electrical devices and that even the non-MR conditional devices are much, much safer than previously thought, and that perhaps 70 or even 80% of all those devices in within a protocol can be safely scanned. And that's really important, not just for cardiac scanning, but for brain, prostate, and the other organs affected where cardiac MR or MR's soft tissue uh, characterization can really help target therapy. Some of the other things we've been worried about over time, NSF has almost completely disappeared, but there have been some cases with normal renal function, although one of the cases highlighted in a few in some small series had had 61 days to contrast, quite high. The DNA break story latest data was presented in this with uh, quality of studies going up really quite dramatically in scale and uh, meticulousness of design and are showing really no suggestion of any serious concerns here at this stage. We have also, however, seen some brain retention of the gadolinium chelates, but this is really the linear agents rather than the cyclic agents. And there's some suggestion still that despite looking quite hard, we found no evidence that this white signal, high signal is, uh, is of a functional consequence, but we need to keep looking at that. John showed us how MR can be used as a gate gatekeeper to more invasive tests. And the two big studies that you know about, the CE Mark II study and the MR informed both multi-center studies. CE Mark II showing that uh, perfusion results in less unnecessary angiograms and that MR inform uh, uh, results in less invasive uh, stenting. And given that the outcomes were the same, that suggests that less unnecessary uh, stent and revascularization was being performed. So quite a useful test given that although expensive, we sometimes apply much more expensive patients to uh, test um, therapies to patients, which it would be good to avoid if we could. So very important data coming out uh, from the, the global CMR community. So just to close off, I think personally, I think it was an amazing meeting. I was so pleased to be part of it. Uh, I thought by now cardiac MR will be sort of sl slowing down and becoming more mature and it will be about efficiency and you know, gatekeeper only, but actually there's real progress and we're really getting insights across cardiology. The talks are excellent, high quality, high definition talks. I would recommend listening to some of those. Uh, I've just shown you some of the ones that I went to, just 23 of the 150 talks. And thank you, all of you, for attending and the speakers and chairmen for making the meeting what I thought was a really major success. So thank you. Thank you, James. That's, uh, that's a great overview. And uh, as you say, this is just a quick snapshot of the talks at the meeting because this, is, this year, for the first time, we had three major rooms. And that was a major new kind of organizational difference of the meeting, the tradition it was only two, two rooms. So now uh, I would like to invite the audience to submit questions. Uh, this is your time to interact uh, with the faculty here on studio and with James uh, remotely. So James, we actually been receiving some questions already uh, regarding your talk. So one colleague is asking if you can uh, d mention uh, the session on cardio-oncology, ECHO versus CMR, how do they complement uh, each other? Yeah, so I heard really good things about that. In fact, somebody highlighted one of the talks by, um, I think, Charlotte Manesty as being a really excellent talk. Um, but I was in one of the other sessions there, so I haven't had a chance to catch up uh, with that one online. But uh, yeah, I think that was highlighted as a really good session. Yeah, you know, about the One of the things about cardio-oncology I've been thinking is we've been looking at you know, anthracycline cardiotoxicity. But actually, there's also quite frail people who people get nervous about giving unequivocally life-saving therapy for their cancers. And sometimes they get stopped by perceived cardiac abnormalities. And actually, MR may have a real role in reassurance as well as, as, well as um, finding damage from the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. I've actually followed the session because we're doing also some cardio-oncology research in Bristol and, and the session was really interesting. So it was uh, Juan Carlos Plana from Houston uh, talked about the role of echocardiography in cardio-oncology and he's been really one of the main driver of this field and uh, he discussed the role of uh, speckle tracking echo in these patients in trying to detect early changes. 
And uh, so the use, the use of speckle tracking in, the, in clinical practice, it's already happening, is in the guidelines, both of the, uh, in the US, and the ESC has issued a position paper recently on that. Mm -hmm. But Charlotte did a great work to show <coughs> the attendees how CMR can actually um, complement ECHO. And I mean, we set it up as a debate that session uh, when we were designing the program. But of course, it's all about complementary um, approaches and technologies to understand more. Yes, exactly. And so it, she really showed nicely how CMR provides really an opportunity to um, image and quantify interstitial fibrosis that can occur early in the natural history of the disease and how that potentially can be tackled earlier rather than later and hopefully change the natural history of the cardiopathology after chemotherapy and radio and radiotherapy. Okay, very nice. Then uh, we have a few more questions um, from the audience here is in fact about the, um, the debate on valves. So one of the attendees is, akin, is asking how we can we compare echo with CMR specifically in mitral regurgitation? What's your sort of experience? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, the first thing I would say is uh, I've got this suspicion that some of our valve intervention is too late and that if we intervene too late, we may leave irreversible changes in the myocardium. Both aortic regurg and mitral regurg are not well studied from, from that perspective, so valve and myocardium. Um, I have to say that I haven't been, uh, I haven't got as much experience as Saul and um, it, uh, the ECHO team at quantifying MR um, and, and the fact that there are so many different techniques by ECHO to quantify it, there's so many number of aspects suggest that maybe we haven't got it exactly perfect yet. And of course, as you know, the MR orifice and the, at jet angles can be really quite difficult to get a full handle on. Uh, so, I, you know, I think, I think I might go back and revisit some of those slides because I think it's an important topic. How are we quantifying correctly and therefore timing our surgical intervention in the best possible way? Mm. Yes, and it seems in fact the valvular heart disease is triggering and cardiac MRI is triggering a lot of questions. Uh, we have more from the attendees, particularly mm -hmm. one colleague is asking how CMI and 3D echo compare in the assessment of mitral regurgitation and perhaps this is uh, too vast of a topic so I would invite this colleague to actually go to the website, to the EuroCMR website and look at the recording of Denise Amuraro from Padua. She did a fantastic job and she has experience with both modalities. Um, Another question. Always, yeah, go on. No, please. I was just going to say I'm always actually amazed by 3D echo, especially 3D TUI and the quality of the pictures. It's when you see the suture, the sutures on the sewing rings and think, you know, you, these techniques are, have got different strengths and combining them in the most intelligent way possible will give the best outcomes for patients. Yes, I absolutely agree with that as well. I think uh, what's, what we're witnessing is that in this multimodality environment, although the three of us and others are pursuing mainly MRI, but we're learning more and more from the other imaging modalities. We have another question on uh, CRTs and ICDs and uh, whether you know, if, whether you can comment about the MRI conditional or, or actually the devices that are incompatible, you know, can it really not go in the MRI environment in your opinion? Yes, so Sven alluded to that, and we've had two major uh, publications recently. One was the New England paper on scanning a thousand devices that I really think everyone should read. And the second was, uh, and they had no uh, major adverse complications, they had no major adverse complications when the scan protocol was followed uh, perfectly. And then the Heart Rhythm Society has produced quite a, a lengthy document with class one and indications. And broadly, they're now saying if there is significant benefit, it, the risks are, are, are much smaller than we previously understood. And that actually, as a community, we need to be rolling out much more scanning for old style, non, apparently non-conditional ICDs and CRTDs. Um, there were a few abstracts as well showing some of the nice new techniques to get over the metal artifact. I don't know if anyone saw those with wide band for late GAD. These are really giving us good images now and, and with safety. But I think there's a challenge because, for example, in the UK, there's only four or five sensors doing non-MR conditional devices routinely 
every fortnight, for example. And I think we probably need 30 centres, and that's for the brain and uh, and all the other organs as well. And actually, as a community, I think we're going to have to lead on that because we have the ability to monitor the heart using our scanners. Okay. Thank you, James. I think I would like now to discuss uh, the abstracts and the, the cases and the science presented at EuroCMR. So, Francisco, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Kara. And um, again, it has been a, a pleasure to, to be the abstract chair for such a, an important meeting. And I'll start with the first slide, with um, referring to the number of abstract and case submissions. And in this historical date, you can see like a significant increase over time in both a number of uh, abstract and cases reaching around 450 uh, works which is quite astonishing and uh, the increase of uh, in the number of case and abstract submissions I think it parallels the interest in the community in CMR and also the interest in, in our Euro CMR meeting. Um, first of all I think I, we have to appreciate the, the huge amount of time and effort that's all the reviewers have, and I would like to thank all 39 reviewers for all the work they had for not only selecting but also creating and commenting on, on the, the abstracts, so which will uh, made these sessions a, a success. And uh, I'll start with the cases, just a brief mention. So there were 198 cases submitted, of which 35 went to the uh, oral cases category, 27 for the quick fire and 21 for the moderated cases category. And uh, again, uh, brief mention to, to the winners, uh, Dr. Xavier Valent, Dr. Paget and Dr. Marciniak uh, as the winners of uh, best oral cases, quick fire and moderated cases. Uh, probably people will be more interested uh, though in, in the abstracts and uh, they'll, they were 263 abstracts submitted, again another record. If we break down by, by topics, you can see actually uh, it's a feature of CMR, you have a lot of variety in terms of pathology, so cardiomyopathy is leading, but uh, other categories not very far behind. So of all these abstracts, uh, there were 32 were presented as oral abstracts, 86 as quick fire, and 27 as moderated e-posters. And the next, and, uh, the next uh, slide uh, talks about the topic. So I ended up reviewing during the, the weekend, tried to grasp more or less what people are, are talking, have an interest mm. in. So again, on top, relaxometry, so a lot of T1 mapping and also some T2 mapping as well. A lot of people having interest in uh, strain analysis, tissue tracking, feature tracking. Uh, 4D flow as well as James mentions gaining momentum but again we also mustn't forget the traditional as well established techniques like plate cat imaging that's part of the core of uh, cardiovascular magnetic resonance. Um, the, the abstracts that ended up uh, rating more, highlight, uh, more highly and being presented in the oral categories were those that uh, had more original ideas but I'd like to stress that these uh, works usually they had larger cohorts and also prospective study designs. So I think it's very important that we go in that direction if we want to go and produce more meaningful uh, clinical uh, data. And uh, finally, the, um, also um, this slide shows the, the winners and congratulations to Dr. Martinez Naharro, Dr. Collis and Dr. Uh, Mashi for a, a best oral abstract quick fire and space moderated e-poster. So I'm going now to, to continue the, this presentation and uh, going to comment uh, on the six best uh, oral abstracts. And I'll start with a, a congenital um, um, work. So the title is Ventricular Response to the Bitumen Stress MRI in Fontan Patients. Uh, it's quite impressive that uh, the authors from, uh, from the Netherlands uh, managed to enroll 74 patients over multiple centers in a six-year period, and they performed low-dose debitamine stress uh, CMR, and uh, they followed these patients over time with a medium of three years, and uh, there were 22 events, and for this combined endpoint uh, of cardiac reoperation ablation, cardioversion, pacemaker implantation, and also others, but 
the, the prevalence or the incidence was smaller. Um, functional reserve defined as an increase uh, in ejection fraction by dobutamine um, was a predictor of outcomes, as you can see in the, the kaplan my curves, and actually, in fact, was the, the only predictor of outcomes uh, if you include uh, on a multivariate analysis, if you include all the traditional parameters and also peak VO2. I'm not sure um, if this is going to be going to practice because obviously the vitamin stress is still you know, a little bit cumbersome technique, although mm -hmm. we're doing o only low dose the vitamin, but I think it's something that is of interest and actually it can be explored uh, to better manage uh, these complex patients with font and circulation. Um, the second study uh, was a very interesting study and commented with James also in involved and uh, really, again, our, our hearts was the Inca Peru study, uh, impact of CMR in the developing world. And basically, um, this study was a feasibility study of a fast CMR protocol trying to implement in the developing country. Obviously, we have to make things feasible, so we have to go for a very short protocol. Uh, in this case, we just basic seen as in late CAT, compressed in around 15 minutes. Um, so, so trying to go in the clinical setting uh, where magnet time is quite important. Uh, so uh, after some training in London in, at parts, um, uh, the, um, the investigators went to Peru and, um, and scanned 98 patients to, to see how this approach would work. So um, at the end, and measuring an average time of 18 minutes, which will translate in a cost of 150 to $170, this quite simplified uh, approach actually resulted in a change of diagnosis in 19%, and a change in management in 57% of the patients. So it shows that this very fast protocol and appropriate mentoring actually is quite achievable in the developing world. If, uh, if you're trying to implement CMR and you don't have a lot of magnet time, I think that could be something to pursue and actually has resulted in important uh, impact in terms of patient care. Again, uh, another very um, important uh, study, and actually this work won the, uh, the, the best oral abstract uh, awards uh, due to the sheer numbers. So it's the, um, the spectrum and significance of CMR in cardiac transteritin amyloidosis, and it's quite impressive. The, the authors were able to uh, enroll uh, almost 380 TER uh, patients, and they compare with 50 AL amyloid patients, and they did a very comprehensive analysis with BNP and also with ECHO, uh, CMR, and scintigraphy. And um, their main findings, uh, trying to characterize ATTR further, is that ATTR appears to be affected by a more asymmetrical pattern of hypertrophy compared to AL, AL amyloidosis. Late CADS was present in all uh, cases, even in cases with very early stages of the disease. And probably to differentiate uh, ATTR from AL amyloid, the degree of LG transmirality and also RV involvement can help out differentiate these two conditions. The cohort was followed up for almost with a, a mean time of uh, 20 months and 65 deaths were reported. And if you look at the kaplan my curves, uh, ECV predicted death and actually remain an independent predictor of prognosis even after adjusting with known prognostic factors. So it just also paves the way to the use of T1 mapping, uh, ECV calculation, not only for the diagnosis of ATTR, but also potentially uh, to monitor the response to, to treatment. So the ne next work was a little bit more uh, at the initial stages, more, more basic intermediate science. And the, the title, the short title was USPIO CMR imaging suggests persistent inflammation in ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so we know that uh, USPIOs uh, are uh, small iron particles that uh, are phagocyted by uh, activated macrophages and uh, use it in other parts of the body to assess inflammation. And uh, in this study, actually, 
the, the, the aim was to apply to the heart and into ischemic heart disease. So the authors stu started with four healthy controls and they did uh, MRIs at baseline one day after you injecting USPIOs second and third day. And they compared then with seven patients with acute MI and second, se five patients with ischemic heart disease. So this was the, the pattern that they found uh, with normal uh, control. So there was a dip in T2 star that was used to measure the concentration of USPIO that uh, went back to normal on, on day three. And if you use that as a reference and if you compare with uh, ischemic heart disease, what we found out was that uh, patients with an infarct, in the infarct territory, the, the T2 star was lower, indicating a deposition of uh, iron particles, which was more significant in the acute setting. But quite interestingly, even in the remote areas that appeared not to be affected, actually there was also a significant drop in uh, T2 stars. So it suggests that the, um, the accumulation of USPIOs uh, in the remote myocardium uh, will signal uh, ongoing inflammation that may act as a substrate for adverse remodeling. Again, this is very early stage uh, research. We need histological validation. We need to understand uh, more uh, what are the mechanisms behind, but again, it's very uh, promising research. Um, moving on to another congenital a study. It's really an uh, interesting study uh, in the Epstein cohorts which is always very difficult to, to manage. And one potential type of surgery is intervention is the, the cone type, which is gaining uh, popularity. So in this retrospective analysis of 34 patients, 12 adults and 12 pediatrics, so a parameter, a novel parameter that will be uh, uh, acquired from the right ventricle long axis, as you can see here, three different patients. And if you use the, the superior tricuspid annulus, as the hinge point, and if you use one line to define the tricuspid, tricuspid uh, annulus and uh, the other line on actually the tricuspid valve, and if you manage to, to define the angle, you can see the higher the, the angle, the more distorted the, the tricuspid valve will be. So uh, in this study, um, RVLA angle was correlated with a primary outcome of technical failure and the results were quite uh, interesting. So in the pediatric population, uh, an angle superior to 75 degrees actually was associated with the needs of a cavopulmonary shunt. And uh, in the adult population, actually, it was a higher angle with associated with the surgical dehiscence or failure of surgery. Again, very promising uh, data, uh, but this is an only center study, and I, I was able to speak with Marina Hughes uh, after the, the session. So she's looking for other centers to be interested and involved. So I think the next step will be to go to a multi center trial and see exactly if these uh, simple methods of uh, measuring RVLA angle could be applied to clinical practice. And the uh, final study uh, was the impact of fine particular matter air pollution on cardiac structure and, and function evidence from the Biobank, UK Biobank uh, cohort. And uh, I think very strong on this study is a very high number of, uh, uh, of uh, individuals enrolled. So they compared over 4,000 individuals with CMR with pollution data. And actually it's quite striking is that fine particulates, PM 2.5, was associated with increased volumes, decreased EF, uh, with adverse remodeling, and actually this fine particulars appears to be the, the strongest parameter compared to NO2, for instance, uh, and um, compared to other pollutants in terms of influence of cardiac remodeling. So again, this is actually quite a wake-up call about, uh, we know the influence of pollution, mainly in respiratory diseases. Now it studies on dementia, and now it's actually quite interesting that appears to be uh, association between pollution uh, and the heart. So um, my key points is that the, key, uh, the, the record number of abstract and cases has contributed to the success of this meeting, which is actually quite important. There's always a very good correlation between abstract and cases and the attendance, and this was no exception. 
And um, regarding the case sessions, they were very well attended and reflected the variety in terms of content and also geographical origin. Obviously, if you have cases from all over the world, obviously pathology will be more interesting, uh, more different. And for the abstracts, they were uh, diverse regarding both techniques and pathology. I felt the quality was very high compared to previous years, and some of the works actually were published in uh, accepted at high impact journals. So despite CMR becoming a mature technique, I think research, as James said, is still expanding, and uh, the future of CMR uh, looks bright. Thank you very much, Francisco. That was a very nice overview. We have um, some questions from the attendees, so yes. quick answers, mm -hmm. please. Uh, can we diagnose uh, myca infiltrative disease by CMR? Um, again, like there are different types of myocardial infiltration, and uh, those that we tend to look at most commonly will be amyloid, and I think there is very extensive core of evidence that post late CAD and also parametric techniques are able to diagnose amyloid. The same happens with fibrous disease. Late CADs is an important tool, but sometimes you might have problems, like sometimes late CAD might be absent in the early stages of the disease, and I think that's where T1 mapping comes into play. Very low T1 values. I think it's virtually pathognomonic from fibrous disease. The, the problem with the other like metabolic conditions like AMP kinase mutations and so they are not very well studied so uh, the few studies that are turning up not with a lot of patients they suggest that late cats uh, appears to be present in the proportion of patients but again obviously like all conditions if it's very rare it's difficult to study so we need more and more Data. studies yeah. to, to prove the, the value of CMR in all infiltrative diseases. Yeah, it's valuable. And I would like to invite the colleague that has asked this question to mm -hmm. uh, check actually the paper that ECVI just published. Uh, it's a multi-modality, multi-imaging modality paper on restricti restricted cardiomyopathies. And so we encompass all various types of infiltrative disease. So another quick question, uh, Francisco, is yeah. that um, so patients that had a cabbage, mm -hmm. can they undergo MRI? Is there any reservation about the sternal wires? Uh, no, so if you go uh, to the 2007 uh, guidelines uh, from the AHA, uh, for saucer levine, uh, so you can see that sternal wires don't pose any contraindication, even if you want to, to study immediately after um, cabbage, if there is any acute event or any stroke, either if you want to assess the heart or the brain or any other organ, it's safe to, to do uh, uh, MRI uh, after cabbage respective of the time. Yeah, thank you. And a quick question for you, James. We didn't have yeah. time to discuss the World Cup. Uh, so the World Cup was cardiology versus radiology. And please, a short summary of the take-home message for that session. OK, so we did, uh, we put the four cardiologists against four radiologists, and they tried to catch each other out. It was a great fun session. Uh, and uh, you, know, it's a, you know, as ever, the best team won. I can't remember who that was. Um, it was the cardiologists. Yeah, I, I liked it. But we also, Kiara, do you remember we did uh, the big CMR quiz because the audience kind of, I like trying to guess what the questions are. And we got an, a room full of uh, attendees and we tried to whittle it down to one person, uh, which we did. And uh, they won an iPad Air, didn't they? Yes. So thank you, thank you very much. So this is uh, with, it's going to, we're going towards the end of this webinar, and I would try to really extend my warm uh, kind uh, thanks to warm thanks to the contributors of the meeting, and of course, you know, James Woon as as the program chair made a, uh, an excellent job. Francisco, as the abstract mm -hmm. chair, uh, mm -hmm. did also fantastically well. But the, actually, the success of the meeting is because there was such a wealth of team helping in the various features for the Congress reports that you will find in the ECVI website. Also the Twitter task force was very active. We had the face of sessions and also the cases on the workstations that the attendees greatly enjoyed. So thank you to all the colleagues listed in these slides because it was really, it's a team effort and the success of the team. And uh, one other feature that was extremely popular Euro CMR was the level one track uh, and certificate. So it's a special track that was designed throughout the meeting. And we had a record number of participants um, signing up for this, up to 340. And these were mainly trainees in cardiology and radiology, 
but also grown-up uh, colleagues performing echo and nuclear cardiology or CT or invasive cardiologists that just wanted to come to EuroCMR to get a sense of what CMR can offer to the patients. This one was included in the registration fees. So if on any of you did not attend this, uh, please come to the next EuroCMR meeting and there will be this opportunity offered again. So don't miss it. And also for those of you that could not come to the meeting, and uh, we couldn't cover in this uh, webinar everything about the meeting, however, most of the meeting is recorded and is in the ECVI website. So every single session has been recorded for you. So just uh, access it, it's a free access for every ECVI silver and gold member, but also for the HIT members. So if you fancy uh, and uh, are interested in accessing this, please become a member and join our community. And also not the least, uh, EuroCMI has been very uh, active and very popular also on Facebook, in the Young Community page and on Twitter, as I said, and uh, both with the hashtag EuroCMI 2017 and the ESC has also been very supportive in uh, reposting those edits. And uh, so just uh, to conclude, ECVI, it's your imaging association in the ESC. It's a multimodality association. Uh, we try to address the needs of a growing imaging community in a multimodality environment. Equally, we have sections dedicated to provide a focus uh, education and research in the different modalities. So if you want to be more involved in our association, well, we will welcome your uh, active engagement. Uh, our next big conference is coming up, is in December. It's Euro Echo Imaging in uh, Lisbon. And this is the world's largest uh, cardiovascular imaging meeting, so don't miss it. And this is also going to look like another record-breaking event uh, with a lot of abstracts being submitted and lots of participants that we are expecting to welcome in Lisbon. There is a special theme this year and it's the imaging and heart failure and interventional cardiology. And the early fee deadline is September, so don't miss it. Still a few months to go, but uh, please plan it ahead. The other meeting that you should not miss, particularly if you're interested in, uh, in cardiac MRI, is uh, S uh, CMR 2018, which is the joint session, the joint meeting between EuroCMR and SCMR, which happens every three years. And this year is going to be in Barcelona, so in Europe. And we expected, again, another record breaking event with a lot of speakers and a lot of attendees from all over the world. So we really working really hard on this meeting already. In fact, it's almost finalized. And so we look forward to really welcome you uh, there. So with that, I think I might use my last two minutes available to ask a few more questions. It's gonna be a sort of a quick fire answers, Francisco and James, in keeping with the quick fire mm -hmm. abstracts at yeah. EuroCMR. So um, we are asking here, uh, what are the urges, urgent indications for CMR? Francisco, like in inpatients, uh, there was one talk about the role of inpatients for cardiac MRI. Yeah. Can you summarize maybe the top indication for inpatients? It's a very tricky question. Just um, just trying to to think like acute heart failure uh, to assess cityology. Um, I, I think it's very important patients with chest pain, troponin positive and normal corals. I think probably I highlight this the most if you want to keep it short. I think that's. Yes. Probably the most important indications. Yes, because acute MI and unobstructed coronary, artery, coronary arteries is a diagnostic dilemma. No, mm -hmm. so it could be myocarditis, could be Takotsubo, or spontaneous recanalization mm -hmm. MI. James, you want to add something? You have 30 yeah, seconds. I'd add out of hospital cardiac arrests and in patients with uh, VT storms. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And another quick answer for somebody asking about, a colleague asking about MRI inform. So actually the, the results have been uh, already presented at ACC 2017. So check the slides online. It was the late uh, breaking trials in, indeed. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for attendance. You've been very numerous in, uh, in registering for this webinar. And so we're very humbled and very excited to receive all this participation. And I would like to thank you, Francisco, in mm, studio with much. me and James that has connected remotely from the UK. Thank you very much. And don't miss the next ECVI events, Euroeco Imaging in December and CMR 2018 in Barcelona in February. Thank you. <laughs>